that's this one is designed to go through the chain mail. Okay. Um, where is that? Basically, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. If you if you're using this, you're gonna die. Hi guys, welcome to another video. In this video, I'm showing you the beautiful Milton Abbey, situated in Dorset in the UK. And we went to see the summer exhibition that runs from July till the 31st of August and is focused on the Anglo-Saxons and it had a brilliant reenactment village of the period. This exhibition shows you how the Anglo-Saxons lived, the weapons, their heroes, and especially King Athelstan's dream. Um, I'm not going to speak too much on this video, but I'm going to uh, highlight some things that I've learned because it was such a, a learning experience and very educational as well. King Athelstan was responsible to unite and create the United Kingdom. He was the first king of the UK and he had a dream or a vision, um, in which I'm going to tell you uh, in a few minutes. King Athelstan was a very hard-working king. Uh, he provided safety to his people, shelter and a Christian outlook. He was also responsible for charity and that no one um, of his kingdom would starve. This exhibition traces Athelstan's dream and journey of the unification and revealing many questions that are surrounded by mysteries and are related to King Athelstan's that was the grandson of King Alfred the Great. Athelstan's dream or vision uh, started when he was camping on the St. Catherine Chapel on the hill, overlooking to the Abbey Church, and he had a vision that he would defeat the Danes in the coming battle. Actually, the vision came true, and he became the first king of the UK. In gratitude, he founded the church in the year 934. But only on the 11th century and on the supposed same spot as King Athelstan's had his vision, the abbey started to be constructed. So this abbey, the first abbey in fact, was in woods and was burned in 1309 by lightning and they rebuilt it in 1332 till the 1500s. Now for a fun fact on this exhibition, uh, did you know that actually Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones and even the BBC The Last Kingdom uh, show were inspired by Anglo-Saxons invasion in Britain? That's right, they were all inspired by the Anglo-Saxons and that's why some of the things that you can see in this exhibition you will notice on the, the TV shows as well. This is such a beautiful abbey, really worth a visit, and this exhibition was really well curated, well organized, and there were lots of people from the press um, 
and people were enjoying themselves. Let's go outside. It was such a beautiful day, it's such a warm weather. And let's check out the historic village. On this reenactment, uh, this historic village shows how people live at the time, their customs, their professions, and what their purpose in the village. Uh, huge congratulations to the Hildsvin group, and especially to the wolves, because they were my favorites, which were the dogs. One of the fun things that adults and children could do on this weekend, and they can do it um, along uh, on this exhibition, is that they can uh, dress up and immerse themselves in the history and I will show you some pictures uh, later about this. So let's interview some of the village Saxons and hear what they have to say about their professions. I'm the group carpenter. Okay. And what is the major thing that you didn't come to? What do they need? Um, bowls, boxes for keeping things in, weapons. So I'm forever spearheads fit into shafts, um, axe handles, things like that, because they're forever breaking them while they hit each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, anything to do with wood, really. I mean, tables. Beds, we make the beds, the tents, the fences. You're busy, you're very busy. I, I am, they normally come and ask, there's normally something needs repairing or making. Or, I've had so far today, I've had a request for a stool to be made, a uh, knife handle to be fitted. So. But that's that's before I start putting the handles on the axes. So I think they'll, they'll have to wait because it's going to be a queue. <laughs> <laughs> and they have tickets for the queue. Yeah, they, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, first come, first served. <laughs> Um, trading with places like Constantinople and Rome, um, taking out furs, sometimes slaves, and then coming back with um, some quite exotic goods because they fetch very good prices. And what do you have here? So we have some of these things are for internal markets. So if you're quite wealthy, you can buy um, beeswax candles, uh, for example. Um, We've got pepper, which is coming from Indonesia, but via Constantinople. Um, cloves. Um, cumin, my brain went. Um, so we've got Indian spices, spices from India. We've got ginger from North Africa, almonds, amber from the Baltic. Um, again, we have cinnamon here. And also the cassia bark, which is the bark of the cinnamon tree as well. Both of which can be used, one, one you would grind, the other you would just reuse. Um, salt's an export from England, so England and Spain provide some of the best um, salt, so we're exporting a great deal. Almonds are coming back from Spain, so it's um, as well. And walnuts from North Africa, and these were actually being brought back by the Vikings, um, who were um, acting as mercenaries in Constantinople, and when they came back, they bring back walnuts, um, so they're quite expensive, but they bring them back. What about this one? Is this our... Well, this this is you. Um, in England, you wouldn't see these because they're a, they're a secret of the Chinese, but they are actually um, silkworm cocoons. Yeah. So you'd see the actual silk, the silk, silk material as a bolt, 
but that's actually so that you can see what it actually looks like in its raw. These are actually made from cow horn, they're actually flat and shaved horn and they're actually used for making lanterns with. So these actually form the, the glass parts, if you like, of the lantern. And that's where the, they, cut, they, they originate from a, from a species of cow which comes from, from the Netherlands called the lant because um, it's got a very transparent kind of horn. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we get the word lantern from lant horn and then lantern. Okay. And then on this side here is how we would pay for money or pay for things. With, um, so you've got the options of, especially if you're, you're operating in other countries, um, so whereas silver pennies were the main, uh, the main, the main currency of England, um, what we've got here, and they're because they're very pure silver, but they don't actually have a value or an exchange value anywhere else. What they have got is their value as silver weight, so that basically you can use them for their weight. So once you've decided how much weight of silver you want to actually exchange your goods for, you can then basically price it out on that basis of the silver weight by using scales like these. And in fact, in, in hoards, historically, what we find are coins that have been cut into halves and quarters in order to make the weight exactly right. Also, you'll see examples of, I mean, that is silver, I think, of, um, of silver ingots like this, which I think will be cut up or melted down. All of this will be melted down. And also we find evidence of pieces of jewellery that's been chopped up or used. Um, very much the case that excuse me, just one over. Really, really hard. Very much the case that you rather than carry money around in a bag or whatever, it's much easier to carry your money around on your person actually as jewellery, but then when you want to convert it into into something that into currency if you like, you can. And we also find these which are actually called hack silver rings, which is where we get the idea the idea of hack silver from. Because you would wear these and they're even marked off to allow you to basically get your knife out and just chop pieces off and make the weight up, which is what you end up with here. Yeah, but it's, this is actually very popular. It's actually very popular. So, what's your name? Gunner. Gunner. And what is your function? I'm Roman Reels. Yeah, it's got a lot of oil. I'm an archer. Yeah. No, they're not mine. They're yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the crowman. They're the lords. <laughs> and they're his dogs. So basically, uh, well, they could use them both for hunting, but it's also um, mercenary as well. So I would go off and fight for them, give them the most money. Or, well, I think it's got the best chance of having a good race. Um, that's basically what they did. But yeah, it, they used, it would have been used for hunting as well. Got some. Yeah, That's the most common type of arrowhead that the Vikings used to use. <laughs> and then you might use one like that. You'd stuff it with lamb's wool, set it on fire. Okay. That's what it's designed for. It's called a fire cage, so it will go through your thatch roof and then set your house on fire. <laughs> um, you got ones like that. That's for shooting birds. Because if you're trying to shoot a, a bird in a, in a tree or something um, and you're using a narrow point, it's a very difficult shot. And if you miss, your arrow's going to end up in the tree. Um, so what you want to use is something like this because it's a wider area. Um, um, so it's not going to go too far if you miss as well. And then you've got the real nasty ones. That's another 
top sort of version of it. A broad head. The ones that are wide like that, they're designed to, as they go into the body, to do maximum damage. So they're going to be cutting arteries and blood vessels as you go in. And that one's a sort of a, that's more to get into the armour links if possible. So as mercenaries, we will always travel with death lots. I mean, this is one of my practice arrows. It's a modern arrow, but I mean that's what I use to practice with, um, with the target. Um, but when we're doing the reenactments and the battles, we have to use oh, right. yeah, yeah. with a rubber tip. Um, and it's got four flights on it, which slows it down as well, so it doesn't move so fast. But, so you've got that one and that one. And I'll show you a replica of one, which is a, a war arrow, as you can see the difference. The flights are a lot longer. So, so it can go further, um, and obviously it's got a, a lot bigger point on it. That's this one is designed to go through the chainmail. Okay. Um, basically, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. If you're, if you're using this, you're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're very, very lucky. <laughs> so your name is thank you very much. <laughs> so your name is Ethel Wolf. Ethel Wolf. And what's your function in the village? I'm I'm the Earl. Okay. I just, I just sit around looking good. <laughs> <laughs> Is the crown really yours? The There's a raven, but yeah, it's oh, mine. Right, yeah. <coughs> I know. I don't know whether I'm hers or she's mine. <laughs> I don't know whether I belong to her. <laughs> <laughs>
lock up into the day and it would go all the way through the horse's neck, but it would it'd certainly give it a running so good go. Enough to, yeah, 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 it would definitely kill the animal. Yeah, and the night would go. Yeah, And this was the Saxon exhibition at the Milton Abbey and the reenactment weekend. Um, remember that this exhibition will be till the end of August, so hopefully you can make it. Um, such a beautiful place to visit uh, alone with your family, with your friends, uh, to enjoy these summer holidays that are coming. Milton Abbey is trying to make a yearly exhibition, so next year will be the Benedictines and after that will be the Tudors and so on. So hopefully you can make it, it is really definitely very worth it to see it and you can learn so much. So thank you for watching this video, give me a thumbs up, subscribe and don't forget to leave me a comment below if you have any questions regarding this and see you on the next video.